everybody, and welcome to the very first Writer's Room here on uh, the Inside Creative Writing Podcast. I am so thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for being a, uh, a member of the uh, Patreon team and joining the Writer's Room. I'm, I'm uh, really excited about this. Um, today's writer is going to be um, Patrick Cahill. He's a 34-year-old from the UK, uh, primarily a screenwriter, and he has shared with us the first 33 pages of his screenplay, Tainted Love. Um, you can follow Patrick on Twitter at PatrickJC83, um, or you can also find him on Facebook at facebook.com slash patrick.cahill.50. Uh, he shared a little bit about the screenplay with me. Uh, it's a rough draft of the first 33 pages of a full screenplay. He actually wrote this um, in a week um, while recovering from, I believe it was cancer treatment. So um, a real testament to uh, finding those <laughs> finding time to write wherever we have time to write. And um, just thrilled to be able to bring this to you today. Before we jump into his uh, screenplay here, I want to talk a little bit about how I envision this writer's room working and how I approach uh, the uh, the submissions that I look at. So first of all, about the writer's room. It is really my goal, my hope for this, that this isn't just me talking to you about what I see in the writing that is submitted. I really want this to function like a writer's room where I'll hear from you, you'll, uh, you can respond in the comments, um, and we can really start a conversation about uh, some of these um, some of these submissions that we're looking at as well as the the feedback that I give right I am not um, I'm not the end-all be-all of uh, correct writing form right um, this is an art after all and we can all approach art from a different direction and different give different insight uh, feedback we can also disagree right uh, with with what we're talking about. So I really hope this will, over time, uh, become that place where we can meet um, as kind of a virtual writer's room and learn from each other. Now, having said that, uh, this is the first one. Um, as you may know, we don't have that many people at the writer's room level of the Patreon team yet. So my hope is this will grow over time. And um, I hope that if you know of some great writers that you value their feedback and um, would love to have them as part of this community, that you'll invite them as well to be part of the Patreon team. Uh, it goes to help support the podcast. Um, you've also got access to the real-time revisions that get posted every week. And then a new monthly, at least monthly uh, writer's room where we can look at a new piece of writing. So we're going to go ahead and get into Patrick's um, uh, screenplay here. Um, it is called Tainted Love, written by Patrick Cahill. Um, when I look at a submission, especially a screenplay submission, um, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of the, a first-time reader. So maybe this is an agent, maybe this is a publisher, maybe this is um, you know, a, a, an actor, whoever gets a screenplay the first time. So I'm not really approaching this having read the whole thing, thought it through, and, and uh, looking at the big picture stuff. I'm looking at that initial reaction, right? What is, what are, what am I impressed with initially? Um, what, um, um, you know, where might I get confused? Uh, just what are those first reactions as the story's taking off? So we'll probably only get a chance to look at two, maybe three pages today. Um, but that's uh, hopefully valuable because those are the two or three pages where your audience, um, and again, I'm not talking about the movie audience. I'm talking about an audience that could turn this into a published work, or in this case, um, a film. Um, I'm talking about how they're going to react to those first three pages when they're making that decision. Do I read more or don't I read more? So we're going to go ahead and jump in here. Uh, Tainted Love. I'm trying to figure out how to make this a little bit bigger. I apologize that it is small. Oh, here we go. We'll make this a little bit bigger. Whoop, too big. Um, so my first reaction here to the title, Tainted Love. Um, I'm a child of the 80s and there was a huge... Um, pop song, I think by Soft Cell, called Tainted Love in the 80s. So in my mind, the connotation is already, okay, this movie is probably set in the 80s. I don't know if that's going to hold up to be true or not. Um, so we're going to scroll down here, contact information where it needs to be. Great job. I'm going to zoom out here for just a second because I'm a big believer in the initial impression, kind of the first impression of a submission. So as I scan just the first few pages here, what I'm seeing is good 
use of correct format, right? I'm seeing my headers in the right places. I'm seeing capitalizations where there should be capitalizations. I'm seeing these um, chunks of language, um, dialogue, description, just like it should be. So this is already a good sign, right? Your, your audience is already thinking, okay, I'm in capable hands here. This is somebody that at least knows format and what a screenplay should look like. Now, having said that, on this first page, I am a little concerned about the length of some of these lines of description here. They seem to be a little bit description heavy, and I haven't read through these yet, so we'll see if that uh, bears out that maybe these can be cleaned up a little bit. So that's my only drawback, just kind of visually looking at this, that maybe this writer is a little bit heavy on description and needs to be a little more concise. But let's go ahead and jump in here, fade in. Exterior farmhouse, Texas day. A restored 65 Chevy Nova convertible in burnt orange sits empty. Engine purring and roof down outside this brightly renovated farmhouse in the hill country. So I'm, I'm starting to see here, I, 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 like, um, I like the feeling of this, how it starts out, but I'm starting to see what I was worried about, which is this uh, description that is too, too long, too writerly, I guess you could say. Um, and it can be simple things like a restored, lose the 19, just a restored 65 Chevy Nova. You can put the little apostrophe in there. 65 Chevy Nova convertible, comma, in burnt orange, comma. Commas are always a little bit clunky. And when you're scanning through them, um, they scream, hey, I've got a complex sentence here, which we're not really looking for in a screenplay. We're looking for just um, minimal, uh, powerful information. So I'd lose these commas. I'm not sure that um, it's... It's necessary. We know that this is in burnt orange. Um, so that might be something that we could just lose there. The restored 65 Chevy Nova convertible sits empty, engine purring and roof down outside this brightly renovated farmhouse in the hill country. So always go for um, really strong description. If you're going to, to use a word in a screenplay, make sure that it is the best possible word um, and that it brings a very specific image to mind for the reader. So engine purring and roof down outside this brightly renovated farmhouse in the hill country. I don't know what brightly renovated means um, here. So renovated, I think, assumes kind of a bright, fresh um, look. So I feel like we could lose this, plus it's an adverb, um, which usually suggests that renovated maybe isn't the right word, even though I think it probably is in this case. Engine purring and roof down outside a renovated farmhouse in the hill country. Not sure about this hill country. Um, I am definitely not from Texas. Um, I don't know if our writer from the UK has been to Texas. Um, I assume that he probably has since he's setting a story there. But I don't know if the hill country is a specific place in Texas that most people would be able to call to mind. Um, if not, then it's really not doing any work for the reader to be able to envision this other than I know it must be hilly there. Um, so we might describe, if it's important to the story, we might describe the setting rather than give it a title. A singular home in acres of prairie with only a narrow dirt track road linking it to the outside world. So again, I, I'm seeing here what I thought I would see before, just looking at the size of these paragraphs, that there's a lot of room for concision in here. A singular home as opposed to what, a, a plural home? I don't know. I think what you're trying to get at here is that this home is all alone, right? A lonely, might say that, a lonely home. Um, in acres of prairie. I think this is already described because it's a farmhouse. That's the picture we have in our mind with only a narrow dirt track road linking it to the outside world. If, that's what roads do, right? They link to the outside world. So you could probably lose all of that because we understand that's what a road does. So a lonely home with only a narrow dirt track, uh, with a narrow dirt track road, something like that, right? That's not perfect. It would need to be reworked, but Hopefully you're seeing how there's a lot of room here to narrow this down, make it shorter and clearer in the mind of the reader. Sounds of distant traffic and squawking birds fill the blazing hot summer air. I'm not sure how we can see this on screen. How do we know that it's hot? Um, because this obviously wouldn't be uh, read out loud. This isn't a narration or anything like that. Um, so I would find a different way to bring in the fact that it's, uh, that it's hot. Superimposed Bender, Texas interior farmhouse, Texas day, sparse interior without the knickknacks that make a house a home. Uh, rather than tell us what it doesn't have, tell us what it 
does have, right? What do we see? Um, so rather than a sparse interior, maybe just start describing to us blank walls, fresh paint, um, newly decorated, right? We just want to go with short um, visual statements here. Prime selling condition. Someone's clearly moving on. Um, someone's clearly moving on. Maybe in an establishing shot, we see a realtor sign out front or some visual uh, clue. Maybe there's some you know, flyers on a table that are like the flyers that people have when they're trying to sell a house. So uh, look for visual ways to show this rather than just tell us this. A tinny radio belts out a classic country tune, the Chevy visible through the window. Okay, nice. A man's hand comes into frame. In his grasp is an old leather suitcase, the vintage battered type Phileas Fogg took around the world in 80 days. I, I like this description as prose, like in a novel, I think this would work well. I think it might be a little too heavy for description in a screenplay. And we also want to stay away from trying to direct the film. So rather than a man's hand comes into frame, just say a man's hand holding an old leather suitcase or an old vintage Actually, old and vintage are the same thing. So a man's hand holding or grasping a vintage leather suitcase. Um, and notice how we still, we see it in our mind as that close up on the man's hand, but we haven't just literally directed the film, which can kind of take a reader out, right? And keep reminding them, hey, wait a second, this is a film, um, rather than just letting us uh, imagine it in our mind. His face and body comes into view as he looks longingly around the room. I don't know what it looks like to look longingly around the room. So does he scan the room? Does he um, examine the room? Right. Try to find a better verb here, a more visual one. His name is Jack Graham, 33. Slick back hair, cutting an iconic James Dean figure in cowboy jeans, plain white t-shirt and pack of cigarettes tucked into his t-shirt sleeve. So again, we're always looking for places to cut out things. So I've got t-shirt here. I've got t-shirt here um, in a format or in a form of the screenplay where we want brevity. We're always looking for places to lose language. So that's always a signal. Hey, I could reword this differently. Um, cutting an iconic James Dean figure in cowboy jeans and a pack of cigarettes tucked into his white t-shirt, right? So we could reformat that a little bit. Uh, I kind of like the James Dean figure here, but I think there's a, a shorter way to do that. Uh, real 50s throwback. So I, I'm getting confused about the time here, right? The, the era that this is happening. So originally I thought maybe 80s based on the title. Uh, 50s throwback. So I know it's not the 50s, could still be the 80s, but I'm I'm wondering at this point, right? So I'm wondering if we can throw a little hint in here somewhere, maybe even Bandera, Texas, June 1989 or whatever it is, right? We're already doing the superimposed, so maybe that's the easiest way to do it. But you could also show kind of a um, juxtaposition where here you have this 50s throwback, but he has a cell phone. Right. So now the viewer knows, OK, this is modern day and this guy's a real retro guy. Um, he throws the suitcase on the table and packs a few meager belongings. I want to I want to see his meager belongings here. The, the things that people pack with them, either in a wallet or a suitcase, tell us a lot about this person. So I want to see what these meager belongings are. Um, he throws the suitcase on the table and packs um a pair of jeans and a pack of condoms, right? That tells me something very different about a guy who who packs um, a, te a teddy bear and a handgun, right? So I, I want to see what these meager belongings are because they can tell us a lot about this character. Radio presenter off screen. Play nothing but the classics here on the Buck Radio to ease your day on this here scorcher. Oh, see there we, where there we have the heat, right? So we don't need to mention the heat before because we get that information here that it's hot. So grab a beer, some shade, and porch ch and a porch chair, and take life a little slower with KXAA 103.7 on your dial. Jack finishes packing, closes the brass cl claps, one cl uh, clasps maybe I think is what you mean here. Clasps one is broken before turning the radio off and heading outside. Uh, one little minor thing, just on a formatting thing, what you're going for here is called an M dash, um, rather than a hyphen, like you have, 
uh, well, like right here. And M-dash is created with two hyphens, and most software will turn that into one long M-dash. Um, so it should be one long M-dash with no space here. You've just got uh, clasps, M-dash, one is broken, M-dash. So that's one of those little tiny things. It's not a big deal, but... Um, you want everything as polished as possible when, when somebody's looking at it to, to gain confidence in the writer. Exterior Farmhouse, Texas Day. Uh, he, as I think about this here, Jack finishes packing and closes the brass clasps. One is broken. This is our first opportunity to see some conflict, even though it's very, very minor, right? He's packing and he realizes, ah, one of these stupid things is broken. There's an opportunity here to show us, to teach us something about who this Jack character is. So just like the meager belongings, you have this small opportunity to show us who Jack is when he faces conflict, even a very small. So this is a very different character if he either overreacts or underreacts, right? So right now, the brass clasp is broken. He doesn't seem to notice or care. That tells us something very different about him than if he overreacted and uh, swore at the thing and and you know and uh, hit it with his hands or threw it across the room or something. So I'm looking for a little more information here to learn something about Jack, even in this small moment, and how he reacts to that first uh, piece of conflict. So back outside, Jack tosses the suitcase on the back seat and gets behind the wheel. A black Stetson hat and sunglasses lay on the passenger seat. Ooh, I like these details. I can really see that. He removes the cigarettes from his sleeve and lights one up, taking a long drag as he looks looks up at the house admiring. I'm not sure why we have the hyphen in there. At the house admiringly, offering a little salute. He puts on his shades and hat, then tunes the radio to 103.7. Another country classic blares from the speakers. So I like this detail here. I think there's, um, as in previous uh, places, there's some opportunities to shorten this down to just really uh, two or three lines and get the same information in there. Jack smiles, puts the Chevy into drive. I'm not sure why we have that um, capitalized and italicized. It almost feels like a camera change right like suddenly we're zooming in on him putting it into drive i'm not sure if that's what you're going for there slams his foot on the gas and tears down the dirt road leaving a dust cloud in the shimmering heat wave uh, we already know it's hot um so i'm always looking for places that i could like uh we don't need that right dirt road leaving a dust cloud behind or something like that dissolve to uh these are becoming less and less um uh, I'm not sure what the right word appropriate maybe um, in screenplays today uh, the less that we feel like we're directing the film the better we usually are so I think um, contemporary wisdom is to leave these kind of cuts out um, oh although it looks like you are going for a six months earlier going for a change of time here so maybe that's why you've done the dissolve is to suggest uh, that little time change still not sure it's necessary exterior farmhouse texas day we're looking at the same shot on a gray cloudy day again don't remind us that we're in a film right that you're directing a film so just exterior farmhouse texas day um the same house on a gray cloudy day um now dilapidated and desolate so we can get rid of some of these uh, supporting words here and just get right to the meat of it. A wasteland with a shack. Superimposed six months earlier. I'm not sure we need that. Um, part of, of screenwriting and really any form of writing is creating little mysteries for your audience to solve. It's a way for them to engage in the writing. So um, I'm not sure we need to know at this point that we've gone back in time. Clearly something has changed. We don't know if we've jumped forward or jumped backwards. And um, I kind of like the idea of not interrupting this with a six months earlier um, uh, graphic here and letting the audience kind of have this discovery on their own. So we pan to the dirt road. Again, lots of camera angle language here um, that's probably not needed. A hazy dust cloud approaches from far away. As it gets nearer, we can make out a white SUV, a blues track, Hold Up by Tony Joe White plays over. I don't know this song. Um, if I was, you know, producing this film, I'd probably look that up real quick to set the mood. Might be something where you go for a more well-known song so that it lands harder with your reader. 
Uh, we close up on the SUV, a four-door cabin pickup emblazoned on it, Kerr County Sheriff. All right, I like that the sheriff's coming in right now. We have some mystery. We have some building conflict. I think you've done a good job actually starting this with some movement. Um, usually I like uh, screenplays that start with a little more action, but I think you have enough sense here that something's changing, right? This guy um, is is leaving this place. So there's some movement there, not a lot of conflict yet, but we get our first suggestion of conflict here um, about two minutes into the to the film. So I think that's working okay. Um, interior Sheriff's SUV Day. Our Sheriff Julian, a.k.a. Jules, is in his 60s, a straight-faced curmudgeon. He's tapping on the wheel to the beat of the music. Okay. Um, Jules mouthing along to the blues music, dishes in the sink, chicken bones on the floor. I, I like that. I don't know if that's a... Uh, that must be from this Tony Joe White song up here. But, um, I don't know. I just... That's nice and descriptive. I can see that. By looking at him, he cuts an authoritative figure. So we don't... We're already looking at him, so we can lose that. But I'm not sure what this means. He cuts an authoritative figure. Um tell me exactly what he looks like, right? Does he have the traditional kind of dark sunglasses? Does he have his hat pulled down low over his eyes? Is his uh, badge particularly shiny? I, these are details off the top of my head, right? But I, wanted, I want details here that I, as the reader, can say, wow, this guy feels very authoritative, rather than have you just tell me. His cracked age face has an air of experience and seriousness. Again, here, I, I don't know what an air of experience and seriousness is. If you can give me specific things to see on his expression that make me say, wow, this guy's really a, a serious guy. Uh, har a little conflict here, right? Here he's singing along to Dishes in the Sink. I want to do it with a country accent, right? Dishes in the Sink, <laughs> chicken bones on the floor. Um kind of undercuts this feeling of seriousness. I'm not sure that's working well, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. Which rises above his off-key sing-along. He brings the car to a halt outside the pharmacy. So this is kind of classic overriding here. He brings the car to a halt. Why not just he stops outside the farmhouse, right? Let's make it simple, make it clear. Exterior farmhouse, Texas Day. The dust cloud settles outside the ramshackle building. Um, so we assume, yeah, we're still at the farmhouse here. Um, so we don't need the ramshackle building. We already have kind of set that up earlier. The dust cloud settles. Uh, the gray sky is given eerie atmosphere with only the sound of wind in the air. Um, I, I like these details. We just need to find a way to do them more concisely with more concision. Sheriff Jewell steps out of the car, surveying the property's exterior as he takes a slow walk up to the porch steps surveying the property's exterior, right? Again, um, another example of overriding. And this this is really typical of a first draft. So I'm, I'm probably being way too hard on this kind of writing for just a rough draft because this is exactly the way I write, right? I, I overwrite and then I go back and revision and pare things down as much as possible. She so takes a slow walk up to the porch steps. We hear a crunch. Jules looks down to see broken glass. Then looks up to the top floor, a broken window. This window also stands out for being the only one to be encased in metal security bars. Jules shakes his head. All right, I like this scene, right? I, I feel like this is something I haven't seen before, where here's this mess of a house, windows broken, um, house is going to hell, yet there's this one window that has security bars on it. So that's that's intriguing, right? That leads me to want to keep reading. Jules says to himself, son of a bitch. I'm not sure we need to himself because we've established there aren't any other characters here. And anytime we can lose these little um, like emotions or directions in here, I think it's good to get rid of them. So Jules can just say, son of a bitch. Uh, we're approaching page three and I feel like I'm getting way too into the weeds here, way too detailed. So I'm going to pause there. I want to talk just kind of generally about what I'm seeing here. Um, and really, the ultimate question is, would I, would I read on from here? And I, I think definitely um, I'm, I would want to read on uh, for this story. I'm intrigued by this idea of the barred windows. I'm intrigued by really who this guy was that fixed this house up and disappeared. I want him to be a little more 
a little more mysterious, right? I like this idea that he's kind of a 50s throwback in some some modern day. I don't know if it's 80s, if it's current, what it is, but I like that juxtaposition there. But I, I want something about him to pique my curiosity. For some reason, I'm thinking back to the opening of Breaking Bad, right, where you have Walter White... Um, in his tidy whities out in the middle of the desert making meth, right? There's there's such a disconnect between the character this guy looks like and what he's doing that you just, you have to watch more. And I kind of want to see a little more of that kind of disconnect, right? There's something about this guy that just doesn't fit. And I think you're, you're partially there with the fact that he's a 50s throwback. Um, but I'm not sure what else I need to see there. I feel like it's something related to the things that he packs in his suitcase. I don't know what uh, kind of character this guy is yet. He feels a little mysterious, maybe even a little dangerous. Um, you know, but uh, like the example I used earlier, a, a teddy bear and a gun um, would would create a character that, that I would think, oh, wait a second, who is this guy? I've got to watch this a little bit more to find out. But I think you've, you've created a great world here. I can really picture where this film is happening. I can see it in my head. Um, and uh, I think your characters are beginning to come to life here, which is a lot to do in just the first couple of pages. So um, I apologize I can't get more into this. I'm partially limited by uh, just how much time um, I have in <laughs> computer memory and things like that to film these videos. Uh, but I would love to hear from you and from other uh, people in the writer's room about um, either the beginning of the screenplay, more into the screenplay, if you get a chance to read the whole thing or, or more of this. And I'd love to hear your feedback to my kind of critique and, and peer review of this. Do you think I'm on the right track? Would you have approached things um, differently? So we're going to end it there. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Patrick, for being willing to share this writing with us. That means the world to me. And thank you for being members of the writer's room. And um, I would love to see some more submissions so we have something to look at next month. Until then, uh, keep writing, keep creating great stuff like this. Thanks. Bye-bye.